So now we have um, a panel called International Dialogues, Putting Poetry in Translation on the Map. The next panel, draw, um, our panellists draw on their experiences to explore innovative ways to raise the profile of poetry in translation. They will ask questions like, how can we publish more poetry in translation and give it a more prominent place at book festivals, in the media and on the national curriculum? Our chair is Sasha, Dug Sasha Dugdale. Sasha is a poet, translator and playwright and former editor of Modern Poetry in Translation. She has published three collections of poetry with Carcanet, <laughs> The Notebook, The Estate and Red House. Among recent accolades for her poetry are the 2017 Chumney Prize, the Forward Prize for Best Single Poem in 2016 for the poem Joy and the Eric Gregory Award in 2013. Sasha is also co-director of the Winchester Poetry Festival. Sasha is joined by the founder and editor of Blood Axe Books, Neil Astley. You'll have been hearing the word Blood Axe quite a lot today, um, because they publish lots of the wonderful uh, people you've been hearing and hearing people talk about. Neil's career has been marked by a consistent and prolific promotion of poetry and poetry in translation, publishing numerous volumes, as many pu uh, volumes published by Blood Axe, winning every prize out there, from the Pulitzer to the T.S. Eliot to the Forward Prize, to name a few. Joining Neil, we have Fiona Sampson, who you've seen earlier um, read in the context of her involvement um, on the Poetry's project. Sampson is also founder and director of the Roehampton Poetry Centre, and recently, as mentioned, um, wrote the biography of Mary Shelley, which has been flying off shelves all over the country, and soon to be internationally as well. Sophia O'Neill is managing director of the Poetry Book Society, as well as Impress and makes her work championing, championing the work of in independent poetry presses, enabling them to have longevity through helping them to market their businesses and have a financially sustainable um, business. Um, before joining Impress, Sophie was head of sales at leading independent publisher Canningate. And finally, we are joined by the first ever British Library translating resident, Joan Kaleo. Jen is a writer literary, and literary translator from German, an editor and an all-round advocate of translation and translators. She also fronts several successful punk bands you may have heard on Radio 6. <clears throat> Jen was former translator in residence at the Austrian Cultural Forum, where I had the um, great pleasure to work with her on a couple of projects that she curated. Um, and her translations have been published uh, by Faber and Faber, Fitzgerald Editions, the New York, uh, in The New Yorker, and Serpent Sale, to name a few. Her debut book of poetry, Serious Justice, is published by his test centre and is available to have a look at up front. So um, I'll leave it to you, Sasha. Thanks. Thanks very much. We're going to begin this panel with a short film uh, which Neil Astley has put together, and Neil's going to say a few words before you see the film, and I think afterwards. So I'll hand over to Neil. Uh, just before I play it, um, what this shows is the uh, six leading European poets. Uh, published by Black Axe. And since this panel is all about innovative ways to get translation, translated poetry to provide the literature, uh, one of the examples is, is video. Um, also, I would talk about ebooks with audio, uh, anthologies, and, and other things in the course of the discussion. But I wanted to start off with this. Um, I'm in the very privileged position of being married to a filmmaker. Uh, there aren't many publishers that are in that position, many editors. so. The advances we've been made, able to make in terms of um, filming poets are uh, greatly indebted to Pamela Roberts and Pierce. And so this is a little se uh, selection of um, six of the poets um, from the Blood Axe list. Živek na kraju je tog grada kako ulično svetlo na koje niko i ne muja njegova svetilka da. Koja žina tog i držeše zidovite zajedno polta naši te spojene dlanki. Obreom razvit, a ne već to socijalite kamen, nego krijat prišano to meče spasovajki bolo sonot. 
Терорното на Божи Луба, Прагот. Прагайки се на копчела, що всекога ще се вратя на предходния цвет. Беше мир, когато напушти домот. Гризнатото ябълко не беше потемнето. На писмото стоеше Марка с остара на пуще на куке. Контивките простови от ради ми се движам и под мене празни ми се лепат, како снег. Що не знае дали на земјата или на воздухот припаѓа. Кој не? Мин фаблија и фјот нечки орде, со ленје. Jeg var barn, drøssede hans hjernestøv og målegrus ned i mine øjne. Så længe jeg var barn, talte jeg som et barn, tænkte jeg som et barn, dømte jeg som et barn. Hver godnat historie, jeg fik, havde sin egen farve. Min far fortalte så en blind under mørkets klokke ville kunne se en regnbue. Jeg så og drømte det umulige, langt borte fra verdens angst. Jeg vender mig op, vender mig mod ham, ser i min fars øjne, stjernestøv og månehus. Nu kommer natten, den lange nat. Mælkevejer morfin suser gennem hans krop med lysets tyngde af smertes ophør. Ida ja lääne piir rändab alati, mõnikord itta, mõnikord läände. Ja ma ei tea täpselt, kus ta parajasti on, ka suurelites, kauga meelas või võibolla meis endis. Nii et üks kõrv, üks silm, üks sõõre, üks käsi, üks jalg, üks kops ja üks muna või muna sari on ühe teine teisel pool. Ainult süda. Ainult süda on alati ühel pool. Kui me vaatame põhja, siis läänes. Kui vaatame lõunasse, siis idas. Ja suu ei tea, kas kumma või mõlema eest peab rääkima tema. Lõmi on poos lehti. Sellel hõõguvad salakirjad. Kevad ja trompeti soolu ja suve safrani väär. Lumi on puhas leht. Ära kirjuta sinna ühtegi nime. Kas tähed peegelduvad ta arvutades kristalles? Aga helles on täht. Ühte aegu kordunutu ja tähtsusetu. Kõik sulaku. Lumi on puhas leht ja lahutus, keelevaikus ja määratu tähendus. Staden glitrede. Staden glitrede po aastnud või astanneri. Tema sa vakert me anlegningar och terrasserade trädgårdar liksom vatten genomlyst och jag såg allt mycket tydligt. Jag tänkte på de stora städerna med katedraler och hembygdsmuseerna på landsorten i Sverige och älvfläset som doftade så starkt och jag minns hur fest jag hade varit vid den lilla katten med de fläckiga tassarna som sprang bort och hur jag hade saknat den. Jag såg mig om och någon grät. Jag kunde inte beakta det. Staden var av genomskinligt glas. Jag stod där. Jag såg min dominerande kärlek. Av pärlor skimrande 
Det är svart och svalarna. Kasse då. Jag försökte locka på den lilla katten. Allt glittrade. Jag tvekade. Jag visste allt. Jag skulle inte komma tillbaka. Jag spelar Haydn efter en svart dag och känner en enkel värme i händerna. Tangenterna vill, milda hammare slår. Klangen är grön, livlig och stilla. Klangen säger att friheten finns och att någon inte ger kejsaren skatt. Jag kör ner händerna i mina Haydn fickor. Och härmar en som ser lugnt på världen. Jag hissar Heidenflaggen. Det betyder, vi ger oss inte, men vi är fred. Musiken är ett glashus på slutningen. Där stenarna flyger, stenarna rullar. Och stenarna rullar tvärs igenom. Men varje ruta förblir hel. Translations are all by expert translators who know the original language and are totally bilingual. Uh, Peggy and Graham Reed, Dave McDuff, Stephen Kachaduri, and Miriam McGilfertrack, McGil 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 Seth Dolan, I was going to pronounce her name, and Robin Fulton. Um, one of the things about using video, in particular with subtitles, is it enables you to bring over the meaning and the music of the poems at the same time, which isn't always possible when you have poet reading and then translator reading. You get the simultaneous experience. And so, for example, the second poet you heard, um, Pia Tafdra from Denmark, her particular music is something that really comes over in her reading. And the translator has to be aware of that in translating her work and create a kind of equivalent to it, to that music in English. And I know from talking to her, from David McDuff, that that's, been, that's always achieved over many years of exchanging versions and phone calls and emails and so on to try and uh, achieve that, and she's worked with David McDuff over many years on successive collections. Um, Robin Fulton, for example, the translator of um, Thomas Tranströmer, worked with Tranströmer on each collection as it was appeared in Sweden from the 1980s onwards. Uh, we started publishing Tranströmer in 1987, and we've also produced an e-book with audio of Tranströmer's readings of over 100 poems. Um, he had a stroke in 1990, so after that he could no longer speak. But his friend, the actor Christa Hendrickson from Wollongo, was a great uh, reader of his poetry and became his voice at public readings. Um, so we've got Christa Hendrickson's readings of the later poems on the e-book. So you get the collected poems of Tranströmer in both languages. You can hear Tranströmer reading the poem in uh, Swedish, as you did on the film. You can read the Swedish text and flip between that and the English text at the same time. So that's something where we're trying to do something different that will help um, get more of the original poetry out, the original music, the original sound of the poetry, at the same time as the written translation. And something else we've done with a number of books, um, with bilingual editions, you do it really where there is a market for a bilingual edition, for languages like French and Spanish and German and so on. You can't really do it for the what they call minority languages because it puts up the price of the book and you don't have the market for that. But you can actually produce the bilingual edition as the e-book so that when you buy the e-book you can get both languages but when you get the print book you just get the English. Um, and something else, um, I included two Estonian poets, totally different poets, Janka Plinski, whom Fiona has translated, a um, very discursive poet, and then um, Doris Karieva, whose poetry is very distilled. And when you see them both reading and see the English text at the same time, you get a, you know, a way into the poetry. Um, 
which I think is helpful for the reader as well as for the translators. So that's my sort of what I wanted to say about that. Thanks, Neil. <coughs> it's an odd time to be doing it, but halfway through this panel, I'm going to do a small introduction um, before bringing everyone else into the discussion. I was really delighted to see Nicola Majura on that um, film, starting the film, his poem, because in a way, Nicola is our bridge from the um, from the session that you, you will have just been at, um, where um, the panellists talked incredibly movingly about exile and poetry, and uh, Nicola is somebody who is a displaced person. In fact, I believe his surname actually means displaced person in Macedonian, and, um, and, and a very fine poet, um, fine poet of exile. It's uh, no less passionate to talk about the ways in which we can make poetry and translation reach the audience it needs to reach, and that's what we're going to do a little bit now. We're going to talk about some of the systems, some of the possibilities, some of the ways to reach those, um, those audiences. I wanted to make the point, however, that translation has always been going on. Translators are the mice behind the wainscot. They're, they were always there, and they're there to stay. Um, but there is a really fantastic moment, uh, a sort of resurgence, really, and um, a renaissance of poetry. So you see before you a few mice on the stand um, actually talking about what goes on um, when people translate literature and, and the mechanisms that we can use to get it out there. So it's, 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 a, it's a brilliant time, but, but please don't forget that it's always been happening, it always will happen. The other thing I, I really wanted to... Um, to point up is that there are many, many different ways of translating, many different forms of translation, and that's something that the, this symposium has been, uh, has been very good at, at highlighting. Translations that are done in collaboration, collegiately, translators, um, like the um, translation, translators, the translations you've just heard, who maybe work singly and know, uh, know the languages, and then there are the sort of extended translation practices poetry and music, or poetry into other genres, which are rapidly growing. And I hope today that we'll talk about all of those um, and the way in which they enhance each other. So I'm just going to ask our panellists um, a little bit about what they're doing to promote translation and to, um, to bring translation to new audiences. But before I do, I have a bit of a left field question, and it's something that I've thought about a great deal, and I want to see what um, everyone here thought, thought about this. Um, I was, as you know, editor of Modern Poetry and Translation, and in the first issue of Modern Poetry and Translation in 1965, there was a poem by the um, Czech poet Miroslav Holov called The Fly, um, in translation by George Thiner, who was himself um, an exile and living in the UK. And um, that poem went into a blood axe collection of Holub, and then in the 90s it was actually put in an anthology of best British poetry. And um, you know, in some ways, that's a remarkable celebration of poetry and translation that it becomes part of the canon. In other ways, that's not such a good thing. And I just wanted to ask the panelists how they felt about that particular happening and what it sort of signifies really for poetry and translation. So I might just start with Sophie on my right from the Poetry Book Society. Thank you. Um, it's a really, it's a really interesting one. Um, I think, I sort of feel like you, the fact that a book, a, a poem that's been translated then gets into a best of British poetry is great. But um, some of the comments that I'll be making over the course of this uh, panel is that I think Poetry and translation needs to be brought to the table as poetry and translation and celebrated for what it is. And what we've learned from today is, you know, the diplomacy, the work, the talent, the subtleties that go into creating poetry in translation is, is, is different from poetry itself. So, although I think it's wonderful, it would be nice if the best British, British poetry collection also had the best British poetry in translation as a sort of section so that it could be celebrated in its, in its own area. I'll just ask Neil, as you're the publisher of Holub, how, how did you feel about that, or how do you...? Well, in a way, it goes back to where, how Holub started writing as a writer in Czech. He knew in Czech that he, he was writing in a minority language, and therefore he was never going to have a big readership. He was also writing and trying to publish in a country where much of his work was suppressed. And he, made, he's talk, he talked about this, a deliberate decision 
to write in a pared down, non lyrical way of writing poetry so that it could be translated into as many languages as possible. So actually, translation was in his mind when he was writing that poem and, and his other work. One of his major influences, in fact, was William Carlos Williams, who also wrote in that pared down way. So that, that in a sense, was you know, part of that translation process. Yeah. He wanted the poem to exist. Yeah, he wanted the poem to exist in other languages. Yeah. Yeah. Fiona, how do you feel about it? Well, I'm very torn too, because I think on the one hand, there's a difficulty, which is, that, which is the language of English. I mean, I think it's a problem <coughs> that we work in a, a huge world language which is, doesn't understand its own power, its own power to corrupt other cultures and modify, um, indeed, poetry is being written in other languages, not always so positively as, you know, as an escape from, from censorship. And I think that it's often an asymmetric relationship. And I think that part of that is the assumption that if you like a poem, it must kind of somehow always already have been in English. So I think that's the problem. On the other hand, I'm kind of, I sort of, I don't, I'm slightly different from Sophie in the sense that I'm I, a lot of my working life has been about trying to get people to just damn well read the poetry that's in translation already and read it as poetry. Don't read it as a symptom of another culture. Don't go to it for the same reasons that you go to poems. And so some of my work, I mean, I used to edit Poetry Review, and a lot of my work there was about smuggling in, in a sense, poetry and translation as poetry, not as a special case, not as a kind of sideshow. So, and yet, of course, I translate and so I care about the process. So it's really complex. <laughs> Jen, how about you? Um, um, I'm the same as Fiona. I'm, I think what she says is about um, we, we, are, we are in the higher point of this power dynamic in terms of, um, I was talking to someone about this the other day, about how it's this necessity as a, a poet outside of English that you, you dream of the day you can be brought into the wide world by English and it is a shame in a way because English poets you don't really have the same problem, you know, you don't have to wait, it, it, it has already happened. Um, but likewise I agree that um, having a translated poem in a collection of, of British poetry, um, yeah, is, is still a bit of a miracle because it's not, it still hasn't become, say, a common practice, but it is that thing I think that com commonly comes up of yeah, in, enjoy it as, as a poem itself, but never forget it's translated. It's always this place. You can't just say it's just a translated poem and it's, or it's just a poem. You have to have both. It has to be this conscious reading. Mm -hmm. I think. Thank you. I'd like to go back to, to Fiona, whose, whose practice has been, um, translation practice, I believe, has been um, about collegiate practice and collaboration and working with poets and sometimes within a translator or um, yes. a, a medium to the other world. Yes, yeah, so that's one of the reasons I was so delighted to be part of the Poet Trios project because it's it's simply by researching what happens when you put poets together to collaborate with a language advisor, you are already, in a sense, making a space for that practice. You're advocating it in a way by making it better known. So I find that very exciting. Yeah, poetry translation for me has always been collaborative. And actually, um, Neil, your, your film was quite um, touching for me because it there are several friends in that film, and one of them is Kaplinsky, who was the first person that who got me co-translating because um, he came to a festival that I used to run in Wales and um, was stuck on some translations and started working with me on them then, and that's how my addiction started. And I think there are probably three ways that poets tend to get involved in trans in collaborative translation. One is a kind of personal aha. You just fall for somebody's work through, um, sort of through a glass darkly. I don't know. You go to a festival and there are a few translations in English, or in my case, it's a French, you know, a language that you also have, and you think, yes, I just want to know more, and you start a particular one-to-one -one relationship, which nowadays, of course, it's much easier than it was when I first worked with Yan because you know, there's email and and Skype and stuff, so you can have, provided you've got a good enough common language and good enough faith between you, you can you can really make intimate, close readings, provided the original poet's got the patience to do that. Then I think there were the kind of marriage-broke ateliers, which are often attached to festivals, and I've been involved in those. 
in China, Slovenia, Macedonia actually, and um, uh, and Paris and so on. And those can be very exciting because they often are seedbeds for then the detailed collaboration. So what comes out of them may be really not very concrete at all in immediate terms, but then you may go on to co-translate each other. Um, I should say that I've co-translated four books, two in Estonian and two in Hebrew, and those are both languages I completely don't have. But my training as a translator was all in dead languages, <coughs> Latin and then Anglo-Saxon, to both of which I was dragged kicking and screaming, oh, this is not creative. And of course I discovered that translation is the most intimate, that word again, close reading, and it's creative, it's interpretive. It can't not be, however faithful you try to be. And so it's, it's absolutely primarily about poetry itself. And then the third form of kind of collaboration is the sort of poetry translation center model, which um, is that they focus on a country or a poet from a country, and they commission um, British poets to finesse, I would say, a translation for which the first stage has been done by someone who has the language, who is a, usually a professional translator. Um, I think that co-translation is controversial. I don't think I know it's controversial among professional translators, and I understand why. But I think that they are forgetting that tradition of finger work, as we call it, that you do with a language you don't know. And I think that they are also forgetting the excitement of the one-to-one -one dialogue that they themselves often have when it's a living writer. And they forget that a poet who is only a poet, like say myself, can, can really love that and can really serve that just as they do. Thank you, Fiona. I'm really glad you mentioned the Poetry Translation Centre because, uh, as I've, I'm sure you'll know, they've done extraordinary work in um, expanding the number of poets um, and, and, and languages that we, we now have poems from. And more recently, I think there's, they've been working great in the Blood X books. Mm -hmm. And I just wondered if um, there is, it does feel at least, and this just might just be my perception, there's a huge growth in the area of collaborative translation and collaborative translation workshops, um, which have brought a lot of new cultures, poetic cultures to us. And I wondered if, if that is simply a perception or if it's borne out by reality. Well, one of, one of the earlier work um, presentations, it was mentioned about um, poets having to take over the work of the translators because translators themselves were not becoming so available. It's worth mentioning that with the closure of um, language departments at universities because of cuts, um, the teaching of particularly of languages, of the sort of minority languages, even Scandinavian studies, we used to have a Scandinavian studies department at Newcastle, um, that has been completely, uh, had a very, very bad effect on bringing forward generations of new translators. I mean, Francis Jones, you know, our wonderful translator here, is someone who came into translation through being a linguist. And many of the translations I've published of older poets from the earlier periods were linguist translators who were passionate about translating and were great at translating poetry. And in many cases, those translators would act as agents for the poets. They would, they would produce the translations and come to the publishers and try to interest the publishers in taking on a particular poet. Um, whereas now, very often, poets don't get translated unless someone gets a grant to translate them. And I think that's problematical because it means that a lot of the major poets that read are likely available, aren't available. Um, there's also a problem of expropriation, I have to say, where um, poets write versions of poets uh, without knowing the language, and I mean, John Patterson's Machado was mentioned earlier on. I mean, that's the available translation of Machado in this country. But if you want to read Machado in a, in a strong, good translation, you've got to read Willis Barnstone's translation or Alan Trueblood's translation from the States, but they're not available here. Um, or you have, you know, Robert Bly is another example of producing sort of his versions of poets rather than the real version, or sorry, rather than the real translation. And I think. Um, poets suffer from being versioned, if you like. But if there are standard translations available, I think that's fine. And then you can look at the versions and see what people are doing that's different. Um, something else that's happened more recently is uh, 
translation competitions. Um, very, very often, uh, po poems are submitted to judges in Delta languages, and I know from reading some of the examples um, that some of those translations have been cobbled together by people looking at all the different translations, creating their own translation, as they call it, but in fact it's an act of plagiarism. And, you know, I think that's something that also is very, it's very difficult to manage. Um, one answer I thought about, but I don't know if anyone would take it up, would be um, each year the translation competitions would concentrate on a different group of languages. So you might have Scandinavian languages one year, or Romance languages one year, and you have on your panel always a judge who knows the poem, that knows the original language. Because even with those, those competitions you get the uh, the poem and the original language available often on a website, um, the judges of that competition don't necessarily know that original language. What they're looking at is, does it work in English? But they don't actually know if it works as a translation if they don't know the original language. I'm going to turn to Jen, who is a translator from German and a, a specialist in German literature and um, and that, that kind of the old-fashioned thing, a, a translator from from the language that, that you've, you've worked for years on. And I just wondered um, if you want to talk a little bit about that, but also about um, your post as, as translator in residence at the British Library. The idea of a translator in residence is, um, is, is a relatively new thing. The Free Word Centre have had a translator in residence for a few years, and Jen is the, <coughs> is the inaugural translator in residence at the British Library. So I wondered if you'd go on to talk a little bit about your role and what it entails. And, your feelings about that? Sure. Um, if it's okay, I, I just want to mention something off, off the back of what Neil said about um, yeah, unavailable linguists, and I think yeah, equally um, in terms of actually studying a language, that's going downhill quite rapidly. But I think what came to mind as well is that um, as, a, as a nation, kind of um, multilingualism and language learning, you know, that's kind of the elephant in the room in terms of we still don't really have a uh, translating a multilingual culture and um, um, in terms of me studying German I definitely see that as an echo of not learning Maltese, my dad's Maltese but he you know when we were young he said he didn't want to confuse us and he didn't want us to stand out and I think that's where there's also a missing generation of poetry translators it's um, you know people that could have possibly been brought up with minority languages um, yeah, exactly. And uh, so, yeah, I studied German at master's level, but only having taught myself German from reading novels and poetry. I started with Eric Kessner because he's got very childish poems, and I was like, I can understand this. Um, but in terms of the residencies, I think um, they're, they're so vital as a foundation of interesting people outside of the translation scene. So I think um, when I was doing my masters and even before that, I found a lot of people who who were very literary, you know, very interested in literature, who were poets and writers, but weren't interested in translation. And obviously we consider this all part of one big thing, but I think there is still fear of, of languages and foreign languages. Um, and I think it's those kinds of people that I'm particularly interested in reaching, people that maybe don't yet have another language or they had a very bad time at school studying languages or still find the idea of translation quite an elite one or something that isn't for them. And I think that's still an issue. So I did a two-year residency at the Austrian Cultural Forum, which I started out as a literary curator. They invited me to do uh, translation-focused literary events and then I said, oh, but I'd quite like to translate some of these writers that we're inviting. Um, could I maybe upgrade to being translator in residence? And they said yes. So I, um, I did a series of events that would always in include a translator. So I think it's getting better now that you'd often have events that were around translated literature or translated poetry, and the translator would be sitting at the back of the room and hadn't been invited in all the conversation. And I think if you don't have the translator there, then, it, then there's going to be mystery around what's happening and what's happened in the production of the writing. So um, whenever I do an event with translated literature, as I'm sure a lot of other people do in this room, 
it always involves the translator or the translator there to be present to answer questions and to talk about what they've done. Um, and also at both the, the British Library and at the Austrian Cultural Forum, I wanted to approach translation kind of um, removing the foreign language aspect, so including everything without the foreign language. So that that has meant in both institutions using multimodal translation. So at the Austrian Cultural Forum, it was getting a <coughs> story I translated and then commissioning people, including Rebecca, um, to translate the short story into food, uh, tattoo, flash art, film, music, and, and to create a whole exhibition that would be a refraction of this text to try and get people to think about the interpretive aspect of translation and how important the translator is in the production of a unique um, piece. And then at the British Library did a weekend masterclass, um, which again was for writers and translators, so you didn't need a foreign language, and we looked at translating English poetry into English poetry, um, translating scent, um, translating um, pictures of emotions without being able to say what the, real, what the actual emotion is in the cliched sense, you couldn't say someone looked angry, you had to explain what they looked like. And I think this makes it less scary, and um, I, th I think I'm not very scary, and maybe not what some people think a translator is, and I want to try and open it up to people. Thanks very much, Jen. And I'd like to turn to Sophie um, from Impress and Poetry Book Society to talk a little bit about some of the schemes that the uh, PBS and Impress have um, brought in, again, to sort of enhance our understanding of translation and the mechanism of translation. Thank you. I mean, most of my working life is spent scratching my head and considering how to sell more poetry and more literature, but often poetry. Um, so, as the Poetry Book Society, um, we've been running Poetry Book Society for two years now, um, so we inherited the recommended translation, which I think has been a section in the bulletin for at least ten years, probably more. Um, but we launched a translation-specific membership um, in September last year, which is slowly gaining traction. I think we've all seen the sign-up flyers on your chairs um, or in your bags. Um, so we feel very justified in having done that because people have been signing up um, and then members who have a full membership or a different type of membership have asked if they could upgrade to a translation membership. So we definitely feel justified in creating that and then a conversation <laughs> I had with Sasha that I was already considering was yes, but if they were, if they like the other books that aren't translated titles, do we have to have a dual membership? And it turns out, yes, we do. We don't yet, uh, but we will. So I think sort of permutations of the, the poetry that people enjoy and want is is endless. But we are we are trying our best to try and kind of produce, provide something for for everyone. So, so that's what we're doing at the minute. We're sort of on our the beginning of our journey in finding the audience, converting the audience, and um, asking them to you know pay to buy books in translation, which is uh, which is what we're here to do and to support the, the endeavours of publishers and translators. Um, and also, we're we're starting a series of live events. So we've got Karen Lida, who will be reading uh, later today. So she's representing Evelyn for us, Evelyn Schlag's translator. So. That's one of our um, recommended translation titles. So we're trying to include translated um, writing in the promotions that we do uh, across the country. Um, then there's also the work we do with Impress. Uh, so we've been working with um, a mix of all publishers across all types of writing, but poetry publishers and publishers such as ARC who produce poetry and translation. So a lot of my time is also spent trying to work out how to increase the book sales through the trade of translated titles. And, um, and it's not easy. It's, uh, I, can't, I, I couldn't give you a straight answer as to where these books sell and who's buying them, but this is our eternal journey, is to find these people. I think they might be in the room. Um, <laughs> and then make sure that these books are getting to those places. But this is where, you know, online sales and the, the, the joy of the internet really, really works. So. We use everything at our disposal, so social media, websites, we've got blogs, we link to blogs. Um, but we're a small company, but we may talk about collaboration later. But I mean, one of the things I want to do um, through Impress and the PBS is work with everyone else because 
there are so many other organisations doing brilliant things. So if we if we pull together, I think we could sort of pool our resources and, and increase the, the book buying or the translated poetry buying audience. And out of interest, is there a surge in translated poetry titles? I, I I believe so. Um, our sales at Impress and the sales at Poetry Book Society have increased over the last 12 months um, exponentially, actually, for various reasons. And I, I did go and double check whether the translated publishers we work with who work in translated writing have also seen the same increase, and, and they have. Um, so, yeah, I think poetry is undergoing a really big boom, uh, and actually, translation, translated poetry is part of that, I would say, from our, from our perspective. Thank you. And I just wanted to ask the panellists, um, we've um, got a few minutes and then I'll, I'll open up to, uh, to you to questions, but I just wanted to ask them really what, what each of them felt we could do at this point to um, increase interest in translated poetry and um, make it even more vital. So I might just start um, with Neil and move across. Yeah, um, to bring things full circle, I was on the board of the Poetry Book Society about 20 years ago, and it was me who actually set up the poetry, the recommended translation. So 20 I, years. I presented a paper to the board arguing that that should be taken on. Um, festivals, I think, are really important and really helpful. Um, a number of the translated poets that we've published have come out, come about as a result of collaborating with festivals. Uh, for example, I first heard the poetry of Joanne Marguerite and Antonella Aneda at Stanza. I first heard Kim Hyasun at Poetry of Manassas, and Olbra, uh, Adelia Prado, uh, Taha Muhammad Ali. Um, but a number of those things have been a two-way process. Um, for example, I first heard Joanne Marguerite at Stanza when the Olbra organizers were there, and they said to me, if you could do a book of his work, we will launch the book in two years' time. Um, Adelia Prado, a wonderful 90-year-old uh, Portuguese-Brazilian writer. Uh, I've known her work, thought, oh, it would be lovely if we could publish her, but I no, I didn't think it would sell at all. That's always the perennial problem. You have to be, you can't take on that many translations. You have to sort of mix them in terms of saleability and accessibility and all that. Um, and then Olga said, if you would publish a selective of her work, we will bring her over. And then we then organised a reading tour by her around various other festivals. And then uh, the BBC um, heard about her through that initiative and commissioned a half hour documentary and sent a documentary maker to Brazil and did this marvellous programme about her. That programme went out and then the book, which previously only really sold at the festival events, sold out completely. Um, because of that interaction with, with festivals and, and with uh, BBC taking it on. Uh, I think that's that's what I would say. And also anthologies. Um, with the Staying Alive series of anthologies, I mixed translations in with the uh, English language poems. When you're reading them, you start reading a poem, you don't know until you turn the page that it's actually a translation. And there is a kind of reader resistance, even among poetry readers, to um, translations because they somehow think they're not getting the whole poem. And then when you read them in those anthologies, they suddenly find, you know, I may not be getting the whole poem in the original language, but wow, what a poem. Um, so, yeah, those are some of the things I would say. Thank you. Fiona, from the point of view of an uh, English language poet, what could we be doing still? Well, I agree. I mean, I agree. I think one of the things you're saying about the BBC is, isn't it, um, Neil, that actually, you know, poetry needs oxygen and that applies to poetry and translation too. I think one of the big things is funding for travel, for bringing poets here to festivals, but also, you know, now the British Council has changed its policy, still somehow getting poets and translators to go abroad, because, I mean, you just, you just do meet people and you make the relationships and you find the poets that you had no other way of finding. It's just incomparable actually being in a place and kind of scouting and, and digesting the culture. Um, I think that we have, I mean, Neilis, I think, is absolutely right about resistances, even among poetry readers. I think that we have a problem uh, with languages that are, with indigenous non-English language communities here too. I mean, a very basic example is that if you write in Welsh, you can't become, you can't be made a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature, as I've discovered through repeated advocacy of men Elvin, who I think is an amazing poet. I mean, that kind of sense that we are monoglot. No, we're not. 
most of us are really badly educated in terms of language and don't have language skills that compare with much of the rest of the world. But you know, English is not the mother tongue of you know of everybody in Britain. Very far from it, and we should be embracing that more. And I, I also wanted to just say, just to come back and briefly clarify that um, I kind of couldn't agree with Neil Moore about the dangers of versioning. It's kind of notion of the British part as this kind of solos whose name goes on the spine in place of Wilco or Mercado. Um, but, and co-translation is the opposite of that. Co-translation is, is about, precisely about, painstaking translation. Um, but I think that there's a kind of, been a kind of shame or a kind of sense that translation is second rate. It's not really, as sometimes my students say, my own creative work. So, um, so poets kind of have in the past gone galloping towards versioning instead of understanding that they're doing something really important in creative and translation. So I think shifting the discourse, and I think probably collaborative workshops really help with that. It's a practice that's really widespread in kind of the rest of the world, but we're waking up to it here. Yes, and that's something interesting that I've noticed from doing translation workshops at Arbonne and in other places, that if you sit with a group of monolingual students and present them with a poem and you explain the context and the words to them, then there is that they are usually very unlikely to produce a version because they understand that they've been, in a way, entrusted with something that is incredibly precious mm. and not to be wasted um, on kind of cheap cheap moves, really. Mm. So I, I, really, um, I really see that there's a huge importance <coughs> for people just understanding what translation is and what lies behind a word or a, a line or an image. Um, it's, that's, that seems to me to be vital. Jen, is that something that you do as part of your residencies? Um, what's that, sorry? The, uh, a sort of in-depth working with people through translation. Yeah, it's a, a kind of translating practice. Yes, yes. yes. So I think as well, um, this, <coughs> this idea of embedding what translation is with um, through kind of workshops or through courses, and we were mentioning earlier that you, you kind of taught me poetry translation up and, you know, six years ago, and, and how that really revolutionised how I conceptualised poetry and translation. But it it is that um, trying to find the balance. It's all about balance and translation. So yeah, it's it's giving people confidence to really go full steam ahead with their own creativity and their own voice, but remembering that they always have to refer back to something that already exists and, and yeah, the sense of responsibility. Um, what I was going to say about the original point was the, the way to embed that <coughs> sense of responsibility, I think, is um, again, it's by pointing out that translation is so much part of um, the culture and literature that we already have. And I, I remember when I was doing my undergrad in, in English literature, we did a course on modernism and obviously as part of modernism we did Kafka and Joyce and Proust. And at no point was it ever discussed that these were translations that we were working with and it was even after university that you suddenly think, wait hang on a minute, I've, I've basically been taught a text believing or like being you know fed it as if it's um, you know it's something that it's not that it isn't. And I think that that is something that ha has to happen. But also Again, to avoid the separation, you know, translation and translatory practices are a really important part of British poets' work. So you have poets like Barney Capital Day, where translation is really embedded and threaded through her entire practice, and it's trying to, you know, prod um, people that only read, say, English or American or English language poets, to say that really to understand these poets that you've that are part of our literary landscape, really you, you should be looking at translation and practice to really get deeper into those works. So it's not even just poetry and translation, it's English language poetry that um, at its foundation is about translation. Mm. And there's so much fun in that, there's so much joy and so much fun in discussing those texts and how they've been translated and what the relationship between the original and the translation is and somehow I suppose when we we, we miss that when we look for that. I think Ilya Kaminsky mentioned wanting clarity. It actually deprives <coughs> us of a, of a very rich experience. So, what, what do you think? How can we? What can we do to, to push even further? Yeah. 
Um, sometimes I sound a little naive, but I, I do get very excited about days like this, where there's a chance to network, there's a chance to brainstorm, uh, people can formulate ideas and work out partnerships. Um, I think there's a lot of organisations that are small that need to work together. So I, I think partnering and talking to each other. I mentioned to you earlier that the Poetry Translation Centre does really great work. So we should be directing as many of our kind of our own audiences there to become engaged. Um, a thing that I've been thinking about recently as well is prizes. Um, the International Man Booker is becoming such an important prize now, and I just wonder if there's a way that a poetry prize and translated poetry prize could be linked to a bigger um, English language poetry prize, like the, the Ford Prize or the T.S. Eliot, so that if it could be sort of set alongside it, you might reach a far wider audience. So that's one of the little things I'm going to be whispering about to various people. Um, the other thing is that I think we need to make sure that poetry and translation has its place at the table. So um, for funding organisations, I think translation is very much there, but for more commercial organisations like the Publishers Association or you know, places like that where perhaps it would never, it wouldn't even cross people's minds to be considering it. Um, I think we just need to be shouting a little bit louder amongst the publishing industry, um, not just amongst the sort of poetry publishers, but the wider, more commercial industry. Um, and look at the, the sales of the US authors that are coming over at the minute, so Ocean Beyond, for instance. That is poetry of a shared experience, and I think translation and translated poetry could really um, benefit from that, because that's the point, that the translated poetry that reaches a wide audience is the shared experience, isn't it? It's the learning something, and it's the emotion that you get. It doesn't matter what language it is. Thanks very much, so I'd like to just uh, open it up and see if you have any questions for the last couple of minutes. Yeah, two minutes. Two minutes. Keep it to two minutes. <laughs> That's questions with a question mark again. Anyone? Yes. Hi, I'd like to ask what, what will happen to all those grants after Britain leaves European Union because you get, uh, you get grants for minority translations into English. I was so, hoping to end on a hopeful note. No, I'm just interested because uh, I'm Czech, so I know that these grants exist. So uh, it's important for poets everywhere. Thank you. Perhaps that's a question for somebody who's actually received a grant related to EU publishing or promotion. Well, a lot of a lot of the European poets we publish, we do get grants from the countries themselves, and it doesn't matter whether we're in the EU or not. They're available for publishers publishing. Poetry in the country, so I don't think that's going to be a problem, unfortunately. One of the things I do wonder about is the, the sort of one of the one of the impacts that's that's not which is already clear to me is sort of resistance to Brexit, which is expressed in poetry enthusiasm. And I feel that very strongly. Uh, resistance to political to xenophobia and political retrenchment, which is is very very strong certainly at poetry readings and in the poetry business. So perhaps that's a small silver lining. <coughs> yes, Tony. I was simply going to comment on the European aspect of trying to get money from cultural culture Europe. It's impossible. Ah. If you're if you're only if you're only doing poetry, forget it. Do not bother because <coughs> you cannot get the required number of points. It all depends on points, and in order to get them, you have to have won. A European Literature Prize. And the European Literature Prize is not open to poetry. So it automatically bans poetry. Now, I've had, I tried to get through into the Commission on this, and they are totally resistant to altering the rules to include poetry. So, I mean, just that, let that be a friendly warning. But <coughs> apparently, it is still okay to, to apply to European money if you, can, if you can get the required points. And um, you know, and the money is there until we actually leave in a couple of years' time, apparently. So um, I think the message is go and grab it. Grab <laughs> <laughs> well, it while you can, because it, it, it's a couple of years if it's too late. But I Neil's quite right. Most of the money that we get comes from the countries in. Uh, yeah, I didn't yeah. mention that scheme because I don't think it's worth it. It's a lost cause, I think. But as you demonstrated, I I think we've just about run out. Run out of time for this panel, I, um, but I would like to thank the panelists 
Um, and thank you for coming along, and thank you also to thank the organisers, um, NCLA and PBS and Poet Trios. It's really fantastic symposium, and I just hope it continues and goes from strength to strength. Thank you very much. <laughs>